So with their Pratt surprisingly generous jazzy new range of models coming out in 10th edition, let's talk about the avian carnivores of Peck with an overview of Crute and Codex Tau Empire. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought we'd do a video focusing on the Birdmen Xenos of the Tau Empire with a review of the noble avian kindreds of the Crute. It's a pretty exciting time for them, given that they were previously just a bit of a sub-range within the Tau faction. Now it looks like Games Workshop might have just about given them enough tools to make a pretty serious army in their own right. They certainly have some strengths and weaknesses, but at the same time they could give a lot of armies some pretty big problems and can still call on a few Tau Empire units to do well in their detachment. In the video, let's talk briefly about the Law of the Crute and their miniature ranges past and present. They go through the Crute detachment, each and every Crute datasheet in Codex Tau Empire, and then finish up with a few overall thoughts and one just very rough example army list. Crute in 40k are a carnivorous species of bird-like Xenos, having many different bioforms within their ranks but generally exhibiting plenty of muscles, big savage beaks, and quill-like spines. They hail from their homeworld of Peck on the outskirts of the Tau Empire, and perhaps the most interesting thing about the species themselves is their ability to absorb genetic traits from their vanquished foes by consuming their flesh, and with feasts like this, their forms re-knit themselves, taking on traits of those that they vanquished. For that reason, Kroot can vary really quite a lot from kindred to kindred. Say one that's been fighting and devouring orcs for a long time might be more brutish and more heavily muscled. And their homeworld's also native to several evolutionary dead ends of the Kroot. Kroot species that have devoured too many quadrupeds might regress to the extent of being Kroot hounds or Kroot ox. Still able to coordinate with the other Kroot somewhat, but evolved to be more akin with beasts than sentient beings. The crew first contacted the Tau when they worked together to vanquish the Orcs at the War of the Place of Union, and Angkor Prok, the crew then leader, pledged the crew to serve the greater good, and their warrior presence is of great use to the Tau. Compared with the more diminutive Tau frames, they're far more able to hold their own in dense close quarters, and their field graft and cunning are legendary. The crew are by far the most common alien auxiliary force, fighting alongside the Tau Empire, and in battle they generally favour ambush tactics and guile to overcome their foes, being adept at dispatching enemy light infantry formations en masse, and typically wielding the Crute rifle, a gun that the Tau Empire have improved somewhat, but also functions just as well as the old Crute fighting staves, bladed hooks used to tear down the foe at close quarters when caught unawares. The Crute had their major launch alongside the Tau in the early 2000s, Plastic Crute Carnivores released alongside the Hounds, Crute Ox and Shapers, all initially in metal. And since then they've varied a bit, being more or less relevant, kind of on the periphery of the Tower Army for quite a while. Forge World did expand their army at one point, giving them their own little army list with things like the Narlock Riders and the Greater Narlock. The last one being particularly famous for starring in Dawn of War for the Tower as one of their super weapon units for Cal Yon. These Forge World models were probably not some of the most popular ones that they made, given that they were for a slightly niche faction in the first place, and they did eventually phase them out, unfortunately. Games Workshop only revisiting the Crutes when it came to the Fast Orker Kim Band, a mercenary veteran kill team that came out around about a year or so ago. In recent times, you could still feel Crute as a pretty major part of an army if you wanted to. You could make them ridiculously hoardy in 8th and 9th edition, often with numbers of between two and 300 models on the table, though given their damage profiles they just couldn't really threaten anything that was particularly tough, and that always held them back quite a bit. So far in 10th edition they've worked really quite well as cheap screening units for Tau forces, but now of course they've received a lot more love, lots of units redone in glorious plastic, and their own detachment within the Codex, it does feel like it's their time to shine. For the new Crute range, their range has been redone in style, as three Shapers, a Carnivore's kit, the Crutox, Crutox Rampagers, the Hounds and the Lone Spear, riding his Chameleonic Steeds, all of that plus the Fast Stalkers, and have initially launched in this launch box, the Crute Hunting Pack alongside Codex Tau Empire, currently on pre-order at time of recording at £135, €175 Euros, or $220. Still looks like there's at least a few of those available at time of recording, for my discount channel affiliates linked in the video description, Element Games in the UK, Fenris Workshop in Canada, and Wargame Portal in the USA still all have some. The GW web store didn't sell out quite as quickly in some places of the world as well, though they did seem to go quite fast in the USA. If you were thinking about picking up a set, anything bought through those links do help support the channel a bit. 
given that the Tau Empire Combat Patrol is focused on the actual Tau units, it seems unlikely we'd get a discount crew deal for quite some time to come after this. Getting into crew rules in the Tau Codex though, and this is the unit list at the moment, as mentioned, four characters, the Flesh Shaper, War Shaper, Trail Shaper, and the Lone Operative, Lone Spear. And then for squads, we've got the Carnivores, the standard foot troops that allow you to get battle line in the crude Hunting Pack Detachment, those Fast Stalker Infiltrating Veterans, the Savage Fast Moving Hounds, the Lumbering Crutox with the Big Gun, and the rather brutal Crutox Rampagers, providing a bit of dedicated close combat that can threaten slightly tougher stuff. It seems that in Codex Tau, they haven't really given you any sort of hard and fast rules as to taking all Crutox or all Tau in any detachments, so you can mix and match. I'm sure that plenty of these will continue to be pretty interesting supporting pieces to Tau armies, particularly the carnivores now that they're objective control too and get that sticky objectives type rule. But I feel like Tau units are going to be particularly helpful to support the hunting pack, even if they don't get any detachment support or stratagems, and it could be a good excuse for some cool conversions. I've certainly seen things before that are broadsides converted to be almost like bigger crew tox with a big railgun on it, and I've seen some pretty amazing and inventive armies over the years. First up, let's talk about the detachment rules, then go through the crew units. The crew hunting pack gives you a pretty spectacular boost to just raw crew efficiency. Two buffs, one damage and one defense. The damage buff gives you plus one to hit units that are below starting strength, and a further plus one to wound units that are below half strength. I think that's a pretty nice rule. It does mean that you can do a little bit of clever play with maybe trying to plink a wound off an enemy before going to town with your heavier damage dealers. Should be easy enough to trigger on plenty of units, might just be a little bit harder on multi-wound, multi-model units, where if you take one wound off, they don't actually technically count as below starting strength. Obviously, when you get plus one to wound, it does get way stronger, but I feel like that's just very hard to deliver reliably. I think in general, you're often going to be in the place where it's fairly easy to get the plus one to hit, but the plus one to wound just isn't very easy to plan around. As if you're half killing an enemy unit, then you're not doing too bad into it anyway, never mind if you're lining up other damage after that. It will trigger sometimes though, and that's definitely a big boost for the sort of lower strength crew profiles out there. The durability boost I think is also a very nice one. It gives all crew units an invulnerable save, a big 5 plus at range, which works really nicely with stealth for plenty of the lighter units. And given that the carnivores and hounds and things are really quite cheap, I think that's kind of big. It does drop down to a 6 plus in melee though, which does mean that it's still going to be kind of spectacularly easy to wipe out crew when they're in close combat with a bunch of volume attacks. They don't get their stealthy minus 1 to hit there, though at least some of the crew toxes do have a big wounds characteristic and some okay toughness. I feel like this one feels most intimidating on the crew carnivore squads. You could get a whole load of them at minus 1 to hit and a 5 plus invulnerable save, or with objective control too and having some good movement tricks. Finally for the detachment, as mentioned, it makes Crute Carnivore's battle line, which I think is actually very relevant here and more so than maybe other battle line keywords elsewhere. Given that Crute don't have that many units and Crute Carnivore seem to benefit from these buffs quite well, I feel like a big Crute hunting pack force, say playing at 2000 points, would be very tempted to take 6 units of them. Getting into the stratagems, and unsurprisingly they're all locked to Crute. For 1 CP, I think the single best of them is Hidden Hunters, any one crew unit can't be shot at greater than 12 inches away, and you choose this after the enemy's selected targets. This one's just really quite big for objective scoring. It means that if you had a fragile unit or an objective that was clearly going to die unless you use this, you might just be able to get yourself victory points and stop your opponent's firepower from ruining that squad. Otherwise, I think the other unit that could really use it well would be the Crew Tox Rampagers. I feel like they're the only real big investment damage dealer out of the entire army, so they're the ones that are by far the most worth hiding. Kind of intimidating to think that you have to get close to them with the sheer amount of volume attacks that they can dish out on the charge. Otherwise, for 1 CP, there's Grizzly Feast. You use this when a Crute kills an enemy in the fight phase, and it hands out Battleshock tests within 6 inches in the enemy command phase. A bit less enthused on this one, it's kind of niche when it triggers, Though I feel like the time to use it would be if you happen to have the chance of swinging an objective if the opponent's unit unexpectedly fails. It does go off in their command phase and that's an important timing as it's just before they score points. Still though it does feel very unreliable and you could be using that for recycling crew units or hidden hunters. 
Speaking of which, Join the Hunt allows an infantry or hounds unit to go back into reinforcements after the squad is slain. And pretty much the best target for this is a 20 strong block of crew carnivores, meaning that you can just get a whole extra block of stealthy objective control to bodies moving onto the side of the board and maybe attempting a charge on some enemy chaff. This one feels like an easy one to use just to add to the sheer horde that the army can bring. I think it's extra intimidating at perhaps smaller point games, but certainly adds to the amount of horde that you could bring at 2,000 points. In theory, you can bring 180 crew bodies for a not unreasonable points investment, and this could add 20 more bodies each time you use it. To my understanding, I don't think the Warshaper will be able to get this for free despite it being a battle tactic due to him being off the board when it happens. I feel like that's probably something that Games Workshop needs to FAQ though. For one command point, there's a trap well laid. This happens after one of your crew units has attacked an enemy unit, and then for the rest of the phase, any other crew units attacking that same unit get extra AP against the target. Pretty handy when you've got quite so much volume of attacks as the crew can bring. Lots of strength for AP0 attacks would like AP1 if they can get it. It is maybe a bit easier to coordinate in the shooting phase versus the fight phase, and could be kind of fun to coordinate with a lone spear who could both hand that out and also get UV rolls against that same target. For one command point, there's EMP grenades, which debuffs an enemy vehicle for minus one weapon skill or ballistic skill within eight inches in the enemy turn. Perhaps the best use of that is if it's a scary enemy vehicle that's going to kill a lot of crews and they care about the stealth keyword. As it modifies ballistic skill, it would actually stack with stealth. It's kind of intimidating to think that you could have space marines hitting on a five plus against the crew kindreds. That's definitely going to make their damage output go down. It's a bit short range though, and your opponent needs to move the vehicle up to, to allow you to trigger it, so I'm not sure it's going to see crazy amounts of use. Finally, for one command point, there's Guerrilla Warriors. This allows you to fall back, shoot and charge, and you declare it in the movement phase. This one's always nice to have access to. Really quite nice for the Rampagers, where you could queue up even more Mortal Wound impact hits from the charge from them, and could be handy enough for falling back and doing actions for secondaries, and in general just being disruptive if you do have things surviving combat. I'm sure there will crop up times where this is absolutely great to use, though it's maybe not quite as much one to fully plan around. For the enhancements, we've got root carved weapons for 10 points. This one gives you precision and devastating wounds for all the war shapers' weapons. I'd say if you're taking one, this is well worth taking on that dart bow they get, given that they get anti-infantry 3+, plus and actually quite a lot of shots. It's still not going to add up to monumental damage for the shaper itself, but I think it makes him a lot more threatening for just 10 points and is worth the include. The Bothrog Land is 15 points. This allows your Flesh Shaper to give you critical hits on a 5+. plus. The Flesh Shaper's buff gives you sustained hits worn in melee, so this will basically get you even more volume attacks. You could be getting a serious amount of strength 4 hits out of a standard crew mercenary squad there. I feel like it's interesting enough to double down on what the Flesh Shaper's good at. In general though, I think it would have been so much more meaningful if he gave you lethal hits, which would have been quite nice against punching up against tougher stuff just that bit more. For 10 points, we have the Crute Hawk Flock. This one gives the bearer's ranged weapons ignore cover and reinforcements can't be set up within 12 inches of the bearer. I feel like if you're taking a lone spear, this one's kind of auto include. The ignores cover thing is nice enough in its own right, certainly doesn't hurt his damage output at all, but the 12 inch deep strike denial is kind of big, means that you could have a lone spear almost operate a bit like a squad of space marine infiltrators. No deep strike within 12 inches, and you also can't shoot him greater than 12 inches away. So it basically means unless your opponent can move miniatures on the board to within that 12 inch bubble, they can't interact with him at all. Makes him pretty godly insurance on a primary objective. Finally, for 20 points, there's Nomadic Hunter. A trail shaper gets plus 3 inch movement to his unit and grants the assault keyword to their weapons. This basically gives you some super speedy crews, could easily threaten some first turn charges given that they'd be scouting forward 7 inches and then moving 10 with this. Could be kind of big for a big first turn move block as well if you really wanted it. You could string out a massive crew carnivore squad across the enemy deployment zone if you'd like. Overall I feel like the detachment generally does a very good job to support the crews. I'm glad that they gave them some pretty universal and general purpose raw strength special rules if they are going to try and carry the army. My favourite stratagems are the Hidden Hunters one and the Recycler units for 2CP. Probably my favourite weapons are the Root Carved Weapons and the Crude Hawk Flock. Nomadic Hunter seems interesting as well, though is a bit more expensive. Maybe interesting if you're trying to do some big first turn movement shenanigans there. Getting onto the data sheets, and we'll start out with the Crude Carnivores. At time of recording, we still don't have the full digital points cost from Games Workshop, 
though if it follows previous trends with the codexes, typically units that were already existent tend to have a points cost at least fairly close to what it was before, and new units generally have come out and just mirrored the printed points cost, as I put crude carnivores at 55 points or 110 in the crude hunting pack, I think that they're a particularly good choice if they do stay at that amount, seem like a really interesting unit. You get 10 to 20 of them in a squad. Their toughness 3 with objective control 2 and move pretty quickly with 7 inch movement. They scout 7 inch forward and have stealth. And as mentioned they have that fieldcraft rule to grant you sticky objectives on a point. Really quite a handy rule. You really want one of these to start at least tagging the home objective before it moves off. And just in general it can be quite nice if the squad's gone down at range. Points that they've marked this way will remain yours unless your opponent can actually reach them. For their attacks, they strike with their crude rifle, two strength four attacks at 12 inches, and two strength four attacks in melee hitting on a three. Their long quill leader can swap out the rifle for a crude carbine at a single strength four damage two shot. I think in all honesty, I'd probably just stick with the rifle out of that. And one of the units can take a tangle bomb launcher, which is worth having. D3 shots at strength 5, AP 0 and damage 1 with blast. It's a little bit more efficient than their small arms. Overall, they feel like they're going to be a very competitive unit, both for tower and crew forces. You could put a crazy amount of wounds on the table with a 5 plus invulnerable save and stealth. The scout shenanigans are nice, having high objective controls are nice, and objective support is good. They do feel like one to go heavy on in the crude hunting pack, and are also the best unit to recycle for that 2 CP as well, giving you yet more interest there. Otherwise, there's the crew's fast stalkers, 12 models for 70 points. These guys have a few interesting special weapons that they can throw in with the squad, but are still largely going to be good against lighter infantry. Their special rules are to get you to ignore cover at range with their Pekra, and get lethal hits and precision attacks against one enemy unit with their Bounty Hunter special rule. I think getting lethal hits is pretty nice, and you still get a fair amount of cheap bodies for 70 points. Probably their biggest selling point is Infiltrators though, to start in the midfield. I think you'd want at least some Infiltrators of some description in a crew's army to make sure your units can scout forward as much as possible. If the enemy's got their own Infiltrators, then they could deny you a whole load of area of the board that you can't scout into. So it makes sense to take at least some of these or some other allied tower infiltrators and put them down early in the game if that's the case. For the dedicated melee, we've got the Krutox Rampagers, young and ferocious Krutox cavalry with 3 to 6 models in the unit. They've got pretty high wound counts at toughness 6, a 5 plus save, and 5 wounds, and strike with a whole bunch of volume fire attacks. Hunting javelins with some strength 4 shots at close range, hunting blades with AP minus 1 and lance and the Rampage of Fists do the main work at strength 6, AP 1 and damage 2, 4 attacks with sustained hits 1. For fighting against tougher stuff, they also get their Line Breaker special rule, D3 mortal wounds on the charge for each model that reaches engagement range. It's not going to happen with the entire units, but that hopefully takes a chunk out of big stuff at least. In the Codex, they're listed at 130 points, which it does feel like you're paying a bit of a premium for them. I probably wouldn't go crazily heavy, but I still think they're interesting as perhaps one of the most annoying and threatening units that you can use that Hidden Hunter stratagem on. It does seem like you could cause your opponent some big problems if you have these moving up the board to threaten charges on an objective, and then you can't shoot them from a long distance. Even some dedicated enemy melee units might struggle to get through 30 wounds worth of toughness 6, and it could be a pretty intimidating unit to charge if ranked up. The Krutox Riders are listed at 40 points in the Codex. They've got a similar sort of stat line to the Rampagers, and are actually a little bit cheaper per model, which was kind of a surprise to me. They've got similar sort of melee, and at range they'll be firing with a repeater cannon. Two shots to 36 inches, four shots to 18 inches, all at strength 7, AP 1 and damage 2. I'd rate the repeater far better than the tangle cannon. I feel like extra AP 0 anti-inventory really is the last thing that crew need more of. Their special rule is a little bit of free shooting against something that shot a crude infantry unit within 6 inches. That seems at least fairly likely to trigger a little bit of extra firepower in the hunting pack when you're going to have quite a lot of crude infantry about. Overall, between their range and melee, these guys also seem like pretty okay brawlers, and are kind of interesting that you can take them in one model units as well. I feel like they could be just nice enough to have dotted around in the backfield to do screening things, and just hold places and do secondaries and things. Not really so much of a threat that the opponent's likely to target them, and they can chip in just a little bit of firepower, and even maybe counter charges if enemy light things get close. Next up, we've got the Crute Hounds, 5-10 models in the squad, listed at 40 points per 5 in the Codex. 
These guys have a similar sort of stat line to the standard crews, but move faster at 12 inches and get OC0 unless they're within 12 inches of friendly crew characters. In combat, they strike with some strength 3 volume attacks, so maybe aren't going to be particularly interesting besides against light infantry, as with quite a lot of crew things really. They still could be kind of okay for cheap screening and move blocking though. It looks like the best trick is being able to advance and charge if they're within 6 inches of a crewed infantry unit in the command phase. Could be getting first turn charges straight into the enemy deployment zone with that. Move up 7, then move 12 inches and advance another d6. And then you've got another 2d6 charge after that. That's an average of around 29 or 30 inches if they're not screened at all. It could certainly annoy some gunline things by having them tied up in combat from turn 1. Finally, take a look at the characters. The Shapers are Toughness 3 with 3 wounds. The Flesh Shapers listed at 65 points, and he leads his kindred in the consumption of flesh to improve their strain. In melee, he gets some AP 1 Twin Links damage 1 attacks, and he improves the squad with sustained hits 1 for melee weapons only. A 6 plus fail no pain, increasing to a 5 plus if it destroys something in the fight phase. I guess between all that, he just adds a little bit more overall mass to one crew squad out there. Maybe not awful to have on a critical carnivore unit going for an objective where you know they're going to attract some unwanted attention. The 6 plus fail no pain it isn't a huge durability boost though, and it's really bad against anything that's damaged too. And the sustained hits in melee isn't awful, but at the same time it's still with strength 4, AP 0, damage 1 attacks for the most part. I guess extra good horde clearance, though I feel like the crew's already had a fair bit of that anyway. Feels maybe a little bit borderline. I guess he could take the boosted relic for the sustained hits on a 5+. plus. He would certainly get lots of volume attacks. As mentioned before though, I do kind of wish he came with lethal hits. The Warshaper is the one that gets you the free battle tactic stratagems. He is 60 points and either gets a ranged or a melee loadout. The melee gets you some AP 1 damage 2 with lethal hits. Not too bad to have in the middle of a squad. I feel like the Dark Blow and Tri-Blade is far more standout though. D6 shots to 24 inches at strength 4, AP 0, damage 2, but anti-inventory 3 plus assault and heavy, meaning that for that 10 point devastating wounds enhancement, then it means that you get anti-inventory 3 plus with devastating wounds, so it actually becomes really quite a scary damage dealer with that. In any case, his war leader rule gives you 0 CP battle tactics. He could lead the crew to do that AP 1 damage debuff, and his Root of Honor allows you to cancel Battle Shock at the start of a phase for a crew unit with 12 inches once per game. I feel like that will genuinely come into play at least sometimes when you're leading a big crew to army, if you can have him in the centre of a formation. Typically it won't actually help out with scoring primaries, but things like stratagems could be helpful from time to time. The Trail Shaper is the guy who leads the crew in ambush. He's 55 points. And as with the rest can join either the carnivores or the fast stalkers. Not really much damaging in terms of either range or melee for him unfortunately. But he does add some pretty cool buffs. A once per turn reactive move of d6 inches for his units when they end their movement within 9. Could be really fun to backpedal from charges and confound the foe there. And otherwise he gets some redeploys with crew ambush. Redeploy his unit and one other crew unit after first turn has been determined. And he can use that to put the units in strategic reserve. Could make him a particularly interesting one to have alongside the fast orca units. You could potentially have infiltrate units that get to move around after the enemy has been seen. Potentially allowing them to go exactly where they most need to to disrupt the enemy. Or to play it safe if the opponent's going first turn and pull back to cover. I feel like he is almost also included for that kind of role. Makes your infiltrating board control units just so much better. Finally for the characters is the Crute Lone Spear, the chameleonic outrider cavalry that operates apart from his kindred. He was listed at 110 points in the codex, so really quite an expensive lone operative as they go, though he does have some pretty interesting stuff. Stat line wise, he moves very quickly at 12 inches and gets to move, shoot, move, so that's potentially 18 inches of movement every turn very easily. He's got 6 wounds at toughness 5 with a 5 plus save and gets stealth, and then beyond that gets the choice of either a Crute Long Gun or Blast Javelins. Long Guns, a Strength 6, Damage 3, Sniper with Heavy and Precision, and the Blast Javelin is D6 Shots at Strength 10, AP 2, Damage 2. That one gets the Assault and Blast keywords, so it means that you could be rocketing around some pretty serious distances, though you do have to get a bit closer to use it given that it's only 18 inches. I think it's particularly interesting for his marking an enemy unit. One enemy unit that gets hit by a ranged attack from him gets marked, if other crew units attack that unit for the rest of the turn, they can re-roll the hit roll, both at range and in melee. 
just feel at least kind of interesting that you could take a pot shot with a sniper rifle at one unit to mark a target and then have your other units really turn up the heat on that squad. There could be a lot of damage output with the detachment rule as well for a plus one to hit. Overall definitely seems interesting, could do some fun skirmishing with that great big blast javelin. And that crew talk flock to deny deep strike could be disruptive, particularly if he's locking down an objective and he screens out things that could drop in within three inches and things. Overall, putting that all together, I do think the Games Workshop have managed to give the crews some pretty interesting units that all have some fairly good roles in game, though I feel like there's certainly one glaring weakness of the whole crew sub faction that I'll get onto in just a second. I feel like crew carnivores are maybe one of the standout units out of them. Really cheap wounds with stealth, genuinely quite threatening to lighter infantry. Objective control too, and sticky objectives are all great. Never mind the fact that they're also one of the best units to lead for several characters and also gets to recycle for 2 CP if they're needed to. They seem great for standard tower, but just stand out awesome in the hunting pack. Otherwise, the rampages maybe seem a little bit more so-so if they are indeed 130 points, but I feel like they're interesting with that hide from shooting stratagem to potentially put something big and threatening somewhere the opponent can't even kill it. The crew tox and hounds can both be really quite cheap units for interference and screening. The fast stalkers give you some pretty cheap infiltrating units and get you a lot more bodies on the board for a similar kind of price tag to the standard crew carnivores per body. I feel like most of the characters can have their place. Maybe the trail shaper might be one of my single favourites given the redeployment shenanigans he can do. I feel like you'd want at least one of them in a crew heavy force. Between those options, it feels like a heavy crew force in the crew hunting pack is going to play as a bit of a skirmishy and board control sort of army. Will probably quite like being matched up against enemies where they've got lots of units that they can actually kill. Enemies that are relying on toughness 3 or toughness 4 infantry are probably a good thing for them to be fighting against with all their volume attacks. They can put a pretty crazy amount of miniatures on the board though for relatively cheap if you want to. At current digital points for around about 1100 points you could get 6 units of 20 carnivores, 3 units of 12 fast stalkers and 3 units of 10 hounds. That's 186 bodies on the board that get a 5 plus invulnerable save and stealth. Really quite significantly hard to take down at range when you've got quite that many of them. Never mind that some of them can recycle for 2 CP for 20 models. And they've all either got scouts or infiltrate as well. So you can be having most of those models being moving into the mid board and getting all over the objectives really quite quickly. Multiple layers worth of bird boys to chew through if you want to take those objectives. Even if you weren't going for crazy all in crew horde sort of things. You could certainly be doing some interesting move block shenanigans with the crew. I did make a video about move blocking in the early game in 40k but that feels like something that crew will do fairly easily. As demonstrated by some tyrannid gargoyles here. Things that move fast and either have scouts or infiltrate or advance and charge like those hounds. They could easily be getting rights to the front of the enemy army all the way from turn 1. And for certain armies that could be a massive problem. Say if you were fighting a foe with mostly vehicles, like a bunch of Imperial Knights, you might be able to position your bodies in such a way that they just can't get past the terrain or even leave their deployment zone at all. No doubt they'll effortlessly kill the cheap expendable screen of units that were just in front of them, but that could easily be worth it if you've just basically held up the bunch of their army all for just the price of one cheap recruit unit, and to add insult to injury you might even be able to recycle that unit for 2 CP. Feels like there's several different options that you could do that with. A unit of 12 fast stalkers could have a fair amount of board coverage. Crude hounds could certainly do so, and potentially with a charge as well, or even the crude carnivores with the trail shaper giving them extra movement. That could allow you a 20 model squad strung out in front of the opponent's deployment zone to give them problems turn 1 and then recycle it when they slay them. I feel like enemies without infiltrators or easy ways to move past crude like that could be in big trouble if they want to score points. As I sort of mentioned a couple of times already though, I would say that perhaps the biggest weakness of the army is that the crew data sheets just really don't have anything good to deal with big tough things with high armor saves. I'm kind of surprised that when they were designing the range they didn't give them at least something that's dedicated to taking down enemy tanks. They don't even have particularly easy access to things like lethal hits. And the vast majority of their attacks are only AP1, so anything with a 2 plus save and maybe cover could give them big problems as well. I feel like maybe making the crew toxic weapon something like AP2 and damage 3 or something like that might have been a bit more sensible if they wanted them to be a bit more standalone in their own army. But I think that the way that the rules have come out is that it's going to make a lot of sense to take some dedicated anti-tank firepower alongside your crew forces. 
Obviously, we've yet to know points at the moment for Codex Tau Empire, but it looks like the Stormforge suits and the Skyray missile defense gunships could be some of the ones to watch. Scary big hitting anti tank with inbuilt re rolls to wound is exactly the sort of thing that the crews are missing, really. Could still be interesting for some sort of conversion work, though. Could be interesting to see some big lumbering troop beasts with big guns on the backs, perhaps to represent sky rays or broadsides. Otherwise, I guess for army weaknesses, volume attacks and melee will kill them really quite quickly. Kind of interesting that they have quite good damage in melee, at least for lighter infantry, but will get taken out there really quite hard if they're hit in return. And just for playing and collecting an army together, it does look like pretty much all of their units are going to have pretty low points per the amount of money that you put into them. I feel like if you want crews in really quite significant numbers and you're going with Games Workshop's standard kit offerings for them, you're going to be paying quite a bit for them. Finally, just taking a look at a very rough Crute hunting pack list idea. Here's a list where I've tried to use every single one of the Crute units at least once, and then back them up with a little bit of tower goodness for some heavy hitting fire support. In the list, I've chosen to go for one of each of the characters. I feel like perhaps the Trail Shaper and maybe the Lone Spear would be my first picks if I had to drop some of them. The Trail Shaper could do redeployment shenanigans with those two units of 12 Far Stalkers, potentially moving them right up to the enemy to do first turn move block things or even bully lighter infantry units, or pulling them back to a midfield ruin to keep them somewhat safe if the enemy gets first turn. The Flesh Shaper can go with a big squad of carnivores towards an important midfield objective, the War Shaper can do the same, and he takes the Dart Bow and Root Carved Weapons for some anti-infantry shooting. And the Lone Spear takes the Crute Hawk Flock to deny Deep Strike and his Sniper Rifle. In this army, he's going to be tasked with holding down the home field objective and denying any enemy reserves getting anywhere near there, plus marking things for other units to get reroll hits on at longer range. I'm not sure whether it might be more sensible to do move shoot move things with the big explosive spear though. That one certainly does weigh more damage, but I thought we'd go with him holding the fort in this one. I've also chosen to include Commander Shadow Sun here, as I feel like she fits in quite well with them. Her rerolls can give the crew unit reroll ones to hit, so she could be pretty handy to have in the middle of a formation. Plus she also chips in with anti-tank fusion blasters, which again is something that crew really miss. Getting onto the units, and there's 6 units of 20 carnivores going all in here, and they're taking their tangle bomb launchers. They're hopefully going to be holding down the midfield points and recycling on death. There's three cheap units of five hounds for secondaries and interference nuisance screening type things. Two units of 12 fast stalkers to secure the midfield and make sure the rest of the army can scout forward if they want to. Three individual crew tops riders with repeater cannons. They're just going to be cheap units to also help hold down the backfield. 40 point beasts to screen out enemies and chip in a very little bit of firepower with those repeater cannons as the rest of the army advances. Finally, there's one big unit of Crutox Rampagers. They'll be at least a somewhat threatening counter charge type threat, perhaps moving to somewhere threatening and then using the hide from shooting thing if they need it, and then maybe hitting an enemy that's taken a midfield objective with an enormous great big counter charge, hopefully dishing out some big mortal wounds to medium infantry or terminators or something. Finally, to handle anti-armor duties, I've chosen to enlist some sky rays, three of them with their big twin link seeker missile racks and a set of tetras to guide some of them. Shadow Sun could maybe hover somewhere near some of the rest. If their points remain at least somewhat similar, they do look like maybe one of the best gunline anti-tank units. Another option could have been to use some Sunforge suits maybe, if you wanted to be a bit more aggressive. Overall, I feel like there's probably enough there to give at least a fair few armies pause. Ridiculous amounts of bodies with 5 plus and vulnerable saves to shooting. Plenty of ways to move block the enemy and keep them in their own deployment zone. Then push loads of objective control to units into the midfield points. And big scary enemy armor can't even relax either. With 3 sky rays ready to stack some massive damage and big saves on the scariest thing that's going to cause the most problems. Overall feels like this could be at least kind of competitive and could give certain armies big problems. Probably most going to struggle against armies that can just thin out loads of cheap infantry really quite quickly. Lots of volume attacks, maybe particularly melee style attacks, could cause big problems there. There's quite a lot of units that really wouldn't want to be getting on the wrong side of a bunch of space marines with chainsaws. In any case, let me know your thoughts on Crew's in 10th edition. I feel like they have gained a whole load of interest and Games Workshop haven't done too badly with their new units. In context of their new detachment, I feel like plenty of stuff is at least interesting and playable. Will be interesting to see if it makes any big splashes on the tournament scene though. As mentioned, look forward to hearing what you think is going to be strong or weak for the crew going forward, and feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics if you'd like to see more like this. I do tend to post new 40k things just about every day. 
Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.